Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? Exceptionally well, Rory. I'm going to be honest and open. This is our third take at starting this podcast, and I'm wondering if it's because it is episode 100, Rory, wait for it, 113. <laughs> lucky for some. <laughs> but it is lucky for us all because it's a phenomenal uh, episode that we have for you here today. We're going to be kicking off by speaking about empathy, but we're taking a different slant on this. We're talking about the neuroscience of empathy empathy. How does it work in the brain? Uh, Then we're going to be speaking about use of self in counselling. That's going to be in practice matters. You're going to be covering this, Rory. What can we expect, use of self in counselling? Well, I'm going to be talking about how we psychologically hold clients um, when they may be discussing really difficult or traumatic material. And um, this is something that sometimes really not covered to a great extent, I don't think, in, in courses. It's, it's, it is about how you use yourself and how you work with your own process when working with clients who may be uh, struggling with trauma and make sure that they don't rupture themselves. In other words, that they don't completely disassociate or, or completely become unwell um, as they talk about what's going on. It's something that I think a lot of practitioners um, need to know, really, Because in some cases, carrying on can be quite dangerous for a client. Like it. Need to know. You're 100% correct. And will know. Just stay tuned to this episode. And then we're going to be closing episode 113 by something rather special, Rory. I'm excited about this. Speaking about your brand new book uh, that came uh, out in uh, April of 2019, and that is Counseling Theory in Practice, a Student Guide. I don't want to give any more away on it than that because we are going to be covering it, but you really want to stay tuned uh, for that because lots of exciting and interesting information coming your way. But let's kick us our, uh, ourselves off here looking at the neuroscience of empathy, Rory. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about mirror neurons. They're cells within uh, the brain, and they reside in a number of areas of the brain, that help us to empathize with others. So an example, if you've ever seen anybody bang their thumb with a hammer, um, a natural reaction for a lot of people is to rub the th- their own thumb as if, as if they've hit it and go, ooh. And mirror neurons, it's hypothesized, are the basis of empathy and also the basis of, of empathic communication between humans. It's what makes humans humans. In other words, we can not only hear and communicate um, with what other people say, but we can also sense how they feel. And it's something that comes up in equine therapy. And this question was asked in our Facebook group. So if you don't know where our Facebook group is, um, if you type in counseling tutor, there's two L's in counseling, knock on the door and we'll let you in. It's a closed group. And you'll meet thousands of other like-minded um, individuals. We have tutors, we have uh, qualified counsellors, we have students, lots and lots of students, um, as well as members of the public who are interested in the world of counselling and psychotherapy. And this question came up, and it came up specifically with equine therapy, a new branch of therapy, where they use horses to um, to help people who've been in, in very traumatic situations because horses are very sensitive and they have mirror neurons and they can sense um, people's emotions. It's a new branch of therapy, one that's uh, gaining a lot of traction. Yeah, I've read a lot about that and seen people talking about it, as you say, in the Facebook group, Counselling Tutor. Get yourself in there if you're not already in. If you are already in, then get involved in those conversations where it's very worthwhile. Uh, And, of course, we see kind of uh, what we may project as empathic responses from things like animals, dogs. If you're feeling sad, it may come and put its uh, its head on your lap. And I I wonder if that's kind of us reading into that a bit there, Rory. Yes, well, well, the term is anthropomorphizing, Ken. And that is where we project human values onto animals. And um, and that certainly the evidence would suggest that animals, wide range of animals, do have um, the ability to, if not empathise, sense the emotions of others. I think empathy is something that we transmit as humans. We show it. Um, we can show it verbally or we can show it in our, uh, our, our nonverbal communication. Um, and certainly, you know, you were talking earlier 
um, off, off air about your dog that comes over and sticks its head in your lap. Yeah, that's that's the same type of thing. Dogs are very sensitive. I'm not quite sure about cats. <laughs> 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 oh, we're going to have a get ready for the for the post coming through your door of complaints from all of our uh, valued cat uh, uh, people out there. Uh, so e- empathy is interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, we, we it, it's part of counselling. It, no matter what modality you practice, there's going to be a level of empathy there. You need to be there for the person and, and kind of reflect back that you understand how it is for them. But the interesting thing for me of empathy is that I physically feel it, and and I guess we all do at some level. You watch a film and something sad happens to the person in the film the next thing you're wiping a tear away and you're sat on your couch watching a television but we're programmed we're wired to feel that empathy and the joy of counseling is we get to reflect that empathy back uh, to to the uh, client so that they they feel understood somebody else gets it uh, very 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 powerful and it's interesting that it does at the end of the day boil down to that neuroscience and and uh, if you think of things like vasivagal, um, vasivagal syndrome is kind of a syndrome. Um, my wife struggles with it. It's when she sees anybody uh, either on television or in real life that has an open wound. She feels it so strongly that um, she's liable to faint within that moment. Even if it's uh, makeup on, on, on a film, she feels it and experiences real, true, honest pain that buckles her legs underneath her. And, and it's a common medical condition. So it just shows how strong uh, our brains are at interpreting uh, empathy and letting us feel what another human being or animal uh, may be going through. Yes, and as I say, the, it's a growing edge in our profession. People like Bressel van der Kolk, um, Dan Seidel, there's lots of, uh, of neuroscientists now talking about how our brain works with empathy, and it's linked very, very strongly also to uh, the work that's been done understanding how our brains react and our bodies react to trauma. So, um, yes, you, you talked about the vasivagal system, and, and, of course, we talk about the polyvagal system, which is the the kind of um, felt sense, for want of a better way of explaining it, of how we feel or experience um, something in our lives. We can physically feel it. And, you know, that example you gave of your wife is is uh, a really good example, Kim. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? I, I remember when studying counselling, um, hearing things like, well, you can't practice empathy how you can study the theory you can study the theory you can practice the skills but empathy is something that just is isn't it it's kind of wired into us as as human beings but it kind of uh improves if you do get out there and start using it be open to self examine self look when you're feeling those feelings uh, embrace them if you're watching a film and it's making you laugh if you're watching a film and it's changing your emotions in any way uh, attribute that to your empathic uh, ability to understand and I, I guess in a way we can exercise that empathy muscle well we can i mean there's, there's some people who can't people who are sociopaths and psychopaths don't don't have that capacity um but uh, in the general population those are a very very small percentage of of the general population but generally speaking it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a range some people are hyper empathic i've got a friend who's massively empathic and some people are on the on the kind of okay i kind of get you but not to a great depth end of the scale it's not it's not a very scientific explanation <laughs> i but, like yeah, it is it really <laughs> but um but I, I don't think there is i don't I, I would imagine there is an empathy scale um but yeah the, that that's the thing we all have it and we can develop it that's the key thing those who have it can develop it um but you have to have it to develop it that's that's the message there Wow. And that is quite a message. Neuroscience of empathy. Rory, I know you've done quite a bit of research in preparation for this little discussion. Uh, And we say this often, but I'm going to say it now. This is really worth going and visiting uh, the show notes for today's episode. Rory's got some super duper links. If you want to read more on the neuroscience of empathy, you just go to Counseling Tutor. Dot com. That is our website. Top uh, menu bar, just click on podcast. Go to episode 113. That's today's episode. All the show notes there and some uh, super duper links on the neuroscience of empathy if you want to do some further reading on that. But moving into Practice Matters. Practice Matters, special part of the Counseling Tutor podcast, where we look at what happens in practice itself and speaking today about use of self in counseling, Rory. 
Abs- absolutely. I'm, I'm going to cover a number of things. I'm going to be, I'm going to cover immediacy. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about boundaries and contracting. Um, but also I'm going to be talking about how you work with yourself. Um, I might even just leverage in just a little bit of transference and counter transference. It wouldn't be a counter <laughs> if I didn't talk about that. Um, um, but also to, there's a, a massive jump, you know, between using counseling skills I'm being a therapist, being a therapeutic counsellor. Um, and part of that is the therapeutic use of self. So I'm going to be touching on how we use ourselves in the service of the client. Practice matters after this very short message about our paid-for service called the Counselling Study Resource. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Use of self in counselling. The therapeutic use of self is prevalent in humanistic and relational approaches to counselling and psychotherapy. The term use of self refers specifically to the ways in which the therapist draws upon their own feelings, experiences or personality to enhance the therapeutic process. Carl Rogers emphasised the importance of a therapist's authenticity in the therapeutic encounter and indeed identified the therapist's congruence as one of the six necessary and sufficient conditions for personality change. Authentic presence in the relationship is one of the most fundamental examples of use of self in counselling. So, how does a counsellor achieve this? Well, using self as a vehicle for therapeutic change can be achieved in a number of ways. For example, appropriate self-disclosure. Sharing appropriately aspects of self, which helps normalise a client's experience. For example, reflecting to a client who feels silly about still grieving for the loss of a parent so long after they died by stating, well, my father died 20 years ago and sometimes I have those feelings. Use of immediacy, sharing an immediate observation or a feeling that comes up for the therapist. For example, I just notice how strongly you're sitting in the chair today. Being present and attending, making the client the sense of your attention for the time you are together, paying attention and clarifying any areas of the client's story you are not clear on. So what do we have to be aware of as counsellors? Well, the first is one of my favourites is transference and counter-transference. If you're using self-disclosure and immediacy, be aware what part of the self it comes from. Are your responses from your here and now adult self or from a child part of you? If it's from the latter, be thoughtful of what puts you in a child place when responding to the client. Boundaries. Use of self in counselling can be very helpful in cementing and strengthening the therapeutic bond. However, always be vigilant with self in case you overstep the mark, giving the client the idea you're offering anything other than a therapeutic relationship. Thank you, as always, Rory. So important, the use of self in counselling. And Rory's created a super-duper handout uh, on the use of self in counselling that you can download for free. You can get that from our mother website. It's our main place to hang out, and that is counsellingtutor.com. Two L's in the word counselling. Counsellingtutor.com. Go onto the website, top of the page, click on podcasts, go to episode 113. All the links from today's episodes are there. Show notes kind of expanding on what Rory and I have spoken about. And of course, you can download Rory's super duper handout on use of self in counselling from within that page. It will cost you not a brass penny, nothing at all. It is free. You just pop in your name, your email address, we will send it to you. And of course, if you are one of our valued members of our paid for service, which is called the Counselling Study Resource, well, we have already taken that handout and we've placed it into your handouts vault for you. So if you are a CSR member, just log in and it is there waiting for you but now it is time for the drum roll drum roll why because we've got something really really special we're going to be speaking about rory's brand new book a book that has been uh, well over a year in the writing a lot of effort and work and research has gone into writing this book name of the book is counseling theory in practice a student guide rory i'm super excited about your book and 
What I'd really like to know is why did you write this book? What drove you? Well, I have to say that part of part of my motivation to write this book was that having taught counselling for the better better part of 10, 10 years at practice level, I began to realise there was lots of things that weren't in the curriculum. In other words, the curriculum is the taught part of the course, things you have to teach, um, that weren't covered. And they were important. They were really important, but they were just completely missed out of the curriculum. And modern curriculum now says that you have to teach the curriculum. That's it. You know, you teach the curriculum, you teach the assignment. And there were things that were glaring glaring things that weren't there. There were just big gaps. So my motivation for writing the book was to fill those gaps in and to make student counsellors' journey just a little easier because studying counselling can be a bit a bit demanding, to say the least. 100%. This is not the first time we hear this. I, I know, Rory, that in the research for your book came very much from um, our Facebook group, which kind of services students of counselling and psychotherapy, tens of thousands of them from all over the world. And they're always asking questions. And you're always looking at those questions. And you're always thinking, is there a gap here that needs filling? And of course, in our paid for service counselling study resource, you also you, you often prepare lectures for those missing pieces that are maybe not being taught um, in the depth that we would hope that they might be in, in the courses. And, and it's not to belittle any of the courses. The courses are far fantastic, but you have a limited amount of time to fit in a, 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 a pile of theory and skills and practice-related material that you're then expected to go out and practice. And uh, very often the courses are set up to get you through the academic part of it. But when you go into practice, people say that they find it different to when they were uh, studying and your book kind of bridges that gap it walks them across uh, and I'd just like to share this insightful useful practical and realistic Rory utilizes all his experiences as a student lecturer and counsellor uh, and an authoritative source thank you for this work and this is Charlie Nagy this is somebody who is a counselling student who has read your book and wanted to feed that back Oh well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I feel a bit a bit kind of wobbly boyish when I hear those kind of things. <laughs> um, but yes, well, thank you, thank you very much. And and I guess the other thing, Ken, is that I wanted to um, make this book available for students who not yet gone in to counselling training. A lot of the questions that I've got are from potential students, people who may have done a level two course or are maybe moving up, people who are thinking of doing a counselling course and haven't yet decided. And one of the questions that perennially comes up is, well, which course do I, which oh, course do yes. I take? You know, and do I take one online? And I talk about uh, the perils and pitfalls of online online counselling courses, certainly at practice level. Um, and uh, I, I talk about that. And I also talk about, you know, how to choose your course uh, and a course that is going to allow you to, to eventually gain you know, go to paid employment. There are some dead ends and um, and trip wires on the on the journey to becoming qualified. And uh, this book is going to stop people um, going down a dead end and tripping over a trip wire. Yeah, that, that I I was impressed at, at the uh, the varied information in your book. It kind of arcs throughout the whole of the journey of a student. And in fact, we got a bit of uh, feedback on this from Emily Aldridge, who said, a great summary of lots of questions that trainee counsellors may be wondering about. It's also thought-provoking, and it's brought up further questions for me. And I think that is really important. I, I, I think you mentioned at one stage, Rory, that the best questions lead to even better questions. That's what questions do. And just kind of looking over the, the, the contents, we're talking 23 chapters here, 23 chapters linked to the 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 journey of a counselor starting out counseling in the real world what does it look like today choosing a course what modality that's another question again and again should I do person-centered should I do a behavioral uh, modality like cognitive behavioral therapy should I go down a more psychodynamic route all covered in the book the fundamentals of counseling and then an evergreen Rory so you're on a counseling course and you are now expected to go into placement well you have a chapter on how do I find a placement and I cannot tell you how many comments and, and, and uh, conversations we've had on our Facebook group of people looking for placements wanting to know what they should do so really covering 
everything in detail. Yes, I mean, I mean, I, I do tell an amusing story in the book. It probably wasn't amusing for the person this happened to um, about someone who came in to a, a organisation that I used to work with and asked the cleaner if there was any if there was any placements and um, and went away um, very disappointed purely because, as I as I as I allude to in the book, did not identified the, who the person they needed to speak to was. They asked they asked the contract cleaner who was having a very bad day from what I could see. <laughs> I hear you. And, and you know, I asked that question. If all this book did was give you that ease into finding the right placement for you, well, wow, it is just worth every penny. And it is so much more of that. Because once you've got through the, the placement, we've then got working in a multidisciplinary team, assessing clients. What about boundaries? So many questions that we see on the Facebook page are related to boundaries in some way. And you cover boundaries in some depth, looking at the ethical context, the major boundaries and the regular boundary issues that we're, we're likely to face. Contracting. Wow. You know, if ever there's a complaint, the first question is, what does it say in the contract? You cover yeah. contracting in some depth, Rory. I do. And it's, and I, you know, I always used to say to my students, you know, the contract is, is the, the most, one of the most important things in the therapeutic relationship because it lays out exactly what's available, what choices the client has. Um, because we do, you know, it is unsaid, but we do retain power in the counselling relationship. Um, so it, it lays out very clearly what the client, what the client can expect, what they can expect from us. If it's a fee paying service, how much they have to pay um, when you're available. So there's absolutely no doubt. And it really comes about, it, this is really about transparency and allowing the client autonomy to make a decision. Client can look at that and say, yes, that's for me. Or they can look at it and go, no, I don't think it's for me. So you don't get into a situation where a client's so many sessions in and then they realize they've actually signed up for the wrong thing. So, so important. And, and um, something from my years of teaching that can be very variable, I've found some organizations have their own contracts. Some just say to the students, write your own. <laughs> so yeah. um, in that case, and which is maybe not a great thing if someone just doesn't know what a contract, a good contract should look like. Yeah, and, and you know that the book is very aptly named. It's called Counselling Theory in Practice because you're taking the theory, the stuff that you learn in the classroom, and you're taking that out into the real world, into practice, um, a, a student guide. But I think that this this bridges more than just a student guide. Just speaking about contracting, um, if you look at contracting, how it is taught, uh, even as a, as a qualified therapist, when I look back at what contracting was taught, it, it's very short and it's a very tiny bit of the course. Yet, with every single client, that we ever see we're expected to make a, a contract and you cover it in great depth in your book uh, you look at the modality you're going to be sharing that limits of confidentiality complaints procedure note taking what happens with those notes you really do a deep dive and you also cover things like the law in counseling what we need to be aware of as as uh, students but also as, as practicing therapists reviewing a client's pro progress that's another question that comes up again and again and again and i think these topics here are quite advanced topics that are so useful for the students but they're also i think really useful rory for a qualified therapist as well yeah ab absolutely there's the there's, there's stuff there that i'm sure that qualified uh, colleagues may find really really useful and uh, can, can i can i share a funny story with you ken about about um the book um we we had a lot we had we had people help us with this and we had a launch team we had people who we allowed to see the book first to give us some idea of if it was a good fit for them and uh, i got um, an email off someone who said oh it's really great your book rory um, I'm going to reference it in my assignment, and I had to say, "No, it's not. It's not out yet. You can't. You can't reference a book that physically doesn't exist, because, of course, the idea of referencing is to make sure that the tutor, in theory, can pull the book off the shelf, have a look, and 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 be sure that the the, the information you've used is valid. And uh, of, of course, uh, for this particular person, I'll say, the person will know who they are when they're listening to this. I had to say, no, you, you can't reference a book that isn't actually published yet. But I was just really heartened with that, the fact that <laughs> somebody, some, somebody was so keen to reference my book 
um, because they'd found what was in it, presumably, um, so valuable. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was heartened by that. And there's good news with that as well, because the, the book can now be referenced because it is available, it is in print, it's available on Amazon. We'll give you more details of how you can get a copy of Rory's book in your very own hands in just a moment. So you can now reference it. And, and, and you know, the, you're speaking about that feedback that has come in so far. Uh, uh, Suzette Betts said, I wish I had this book when I started my journey as a counselling student. It contains relevant information at a level that is understandable. It reels, reads well and definitely worth the money so there you go i mean these are counseling students at various stages in their journey saying how useful the book has been uh, for them but you also I, I guess apart from kind of looking at the study journey and what we need to know there you start delving down into some important topics again that are maybe taught at a shallow level on courses and and a deeper understanding is useful for anybody things like probably a word that you, you you won't be that familiar with Rory I say this tongue-in-cheek for those of you who don't listen often because we we're always joking about transference and counter-transference but you've got quite a hefty chapter I have to say Rory on uh, transference in the therapy room yeah it's it's one of those things that um, I, I kind of get frustrated I've, I've heard people say well, in person centered therapy, you know, there isn't any transference and counter transference. Yes, there is. And it was alluded to in Roger's green book, Client Centered Therapy. So even Roger's himself um, alluded to it and acknowledged it. Um, but it's, it's one of the, through the years, it's, it's one of those topics that I find that students struggle with. They just struggle with it. Um, and I, th I think it's because um, it's such a kind of nuanced thing. Um, it's not it's not a kind of a b and c it's it's something you have to be aware of in, in yourself and also be aware of where, where that's coming from so it's, it's as much linked to personal development as it is to theory um so i've done a whole chapter on it and given some really clear examples i think of transference from my own experience um working working in 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 the profession um you know i gave an example of a student and also um, I give I give other examples of transference and why we need to pay attention to it. Um, not that I mention it very much, Ken. <laughs> it is an important topic, and and there's there's hardly a podcast episode that goes by that we don't mention transference and counter transference, Rory. Rory, but it, the 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 dive into the deeper material doesn't stop there because I mean you look at using timelines in counselling, so so important. Taking risks now, this is advanced stuff. That taking risk, that immediacy within your therapy room, and of course something that comes up from uh, uh, again and again and that is making referrals how to do that appropriately and and these are the kind of things you want to be reading beforehand and preparing yourself for the last thing you want is the client to be in front of you presenting with something that you're not able to help them with and then scrambling around wondering how to make a referral it's all covered in the book trauma informed practice working within your very own competence which of course keys in to those making of uh, uh, ref referrals and then an interesting uh, chapter for me Rory was that third person in the room give us just a little taster of that third person in the room yes well if you're if you're recording something if you're using a recording a lot of students are asked um, through the arc of their training to produce recordings and you know I supervise students who are asked to take client recordings in so they can be critiqued not the clients I hasten to add the the, thera the therapist I mean when when we listen to recordings we're listening to the therapist's reaction. We're not, we're not kind of um, observing the clients as, as, as such. Um, and I talk about how to work with that, what you need to be thoughtful of, um, issues around confidentiality, so important. Um, but it does change the dynamic. You know, I, I was working with someone the other day, a, a supervisee, who just acknowledged it was just so, so difficult um, working with a voice recorder in the room because it did literally feel like there's someone else sitting there. I guess at some level there is another person sitting yeah, there because yeah. after the fact someone's listening to that recording and these are the things that we need to take into consideration you know and speaking through this it sounds like heavy material sounds like a lot of in-depth material but Rory you've got a, a very special way at bringing information over it's uh, I call it Rory's secret source and I think that it's it's part of the success of Counselling Tutor as a brand uh, it's certainly appreciated by uh, our valued members of our counselling study resource who report back on this 
all the time where they'll say, Rory, it was difficult theory, it was heavy material, but the way you put it over made it easy to understand. And in fact, I've got a, uh, a, 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 a comment that came in on your book uh, from Shelby Priestley, a counseling student who said, the first and only counseling book I have ever read cover to cover. I would recommend this book to anyone studying counselling. Very easy to read and packed with concise, invaluable information. Having this book with me through my studies provides me with a newfound confidence. And you know, these are thick theory topics and it's about that thick theory into practice but just the way you put that over from a fellow counseling student saying it was a pleasure to read I wanted to read more I found it easy to read and it is a companion throughout my studies I think it's a must I really I've read the book I, I, I'm on my second read at the moment and and finding new stuff on my second read Rory I'm so grateful that you brought this book to market uh, the the 24 chapters not 23 there's a bonus chapter in there and uh, all of you uh, qualified counsellors will love the bonus chapter. It's called Getting Work. Oh yeah. Boy, do we talk about that a lot. Getting Work. It's all there for you. So that is Rory's brand new book. Uh, it is published. It is in the marketplace. It's called Counselling Theory in Practice, A Student Guide. How can we get hold of a copy of your book, Rory? Well, um, if you want to, you can go to um, Rory'sNewBook.com. That's the that's the key thing. Just type in Rory'sNewBook.com, um, and uh, you'll find a page which will lead you um, to to be able to purchase it. It's also available on Amazon if you just type in my name, Rory Lee's Oaks. Um, you'll you'll find it in there. But Rory'sNewBook.com, and we'll just signpost you directly to where you where you can buy it. And uh, yes, I'm very humbled by the, the comments. Okay, and I, it feels like I've just dumped my brain into the pages of a book, and uh, and and it's it's all uh, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> it's I a don't pleasure know what else to, thumb, to say really. It's a pleasure to thumb through your b brain, Rory. And of course, um, if if you want to get kind of a, a direct link to that, just go to counselingtutor.com. That's our website. That's where we hang out. That's where Rory and I hang out. Counselingtutor.com, um, and right there on our homepage, you'll 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 see that Rory's book is available. Uh, and if you wish to, you can go to today's podcast episode, episode one hundred and thirteen. You'll find that from the top menu bar. Just click podcast episode one hundred and thirteen, and of course. Of course, the link to Rory's book is there again. And just a reminder, write this down. Counseling Theory in Practice, a student guide. Get it. It will be a companion if you're a student. And if you have already uh, graduated and you're out there in the practice, it will be an excellent reference guide for your practice. Thank you very much for writing the book, Rory. And that kind of brings us to the end of what has been a most super duper episode. Yes, we started off by looking at mirror neurons, the neuroscience of counselling. I talked about um, holding, psychologically holding counselling, counselling clients in the room, um, being present, and then we moved on to um, discussing my new book, which uh, which is uh, slightly um, slightly embarrassing for me, if I'm honest. Can it's <laughs> I'm very I'm very happy it's out, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, my new book. So if you if you feel inclined to have a look and have a read, I'll be uh, I'll be very pleased about that. And uh, as always, stay grounded, <laughs> stay safe. Before I check out, if you have got a copy of Rory's book, you like what you see there, please take a moment, go to Amazon, leave Rory a review. It's those reviews that get the book seen by other students of counselling, by other counsellors, kind of gives uh, Amazon. Uh, a nudge to say yes this is of value and they do put it up so please if you've got a copy of Rory's book please go give a review if you haven't got a copy of Rory's book go and get a copy and then leave a review this has been 100 episode 113 thanks for joining us take the stress out of your counseling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the counseling study resource Counseling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counseling and psychotherapy. See how Counseling Study Resource can help you. Visit counselingtutor.com. That's counselingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counseling Tutor podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www dot counselingtutor dot com